Welcome, my name is Brendan Jones and I'm going to be your guide through an exploration of Leicester Rugby, Leicester people, a community history. Obviously it was amateur in those days until 1996 when it turned professional and the game itself has changed a lot because there are lots of things that you can do now that you couldn't do then mm. and vice versa. I mean, there were lots of punches thrown in the 1960s, whereas people would get yellow carded today. But, lot, I mean, there are lots of uh, rule changes like uh, knock-ons and different point systems. When I started watching, a, a try was only three points. Mm -hmm. Now it's five. So, uh, yes, it's changed a lot, and I'm sure it's a lot... The players now are a lot fat, a lot fitter. Mm. I nearly said fatter. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably true as well. But a lot fitter than they were in those mm. days. They didn't. They don't spend their training time after the match at, at the bar like they used to. I don't think so. I I I do sort of um, yearn a bit for the day, for the old amateur days. Mm. Um, it's got too big now and too much. I mean, it costs it costs so much to go and. Um, I know it's, it's still far, far less than, my, than, 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 than football. You know, my, my wife pays about a million quid for her season ticket, whereas I pay you know, a lot less than that. Um, I, don't, I don't really like the way it's gone professional, isn't it professional? But it had to go professional, otherwise some mm. entrepreneur would have, would have made, because it's so popular. Um, mm. It had to go professional, but I don't like it going professional. Okay. Um, I used to prefer the old days of amateur and... Um, you know, you had a policeman and an art collector in, on the team and a teacher, you know. Um, but it had to go professional and the standards have raised, the standards have gone up. Um, so I suppose it has, it has its good points, but um, I prefer the olden days, the, old, the amateur days. Well, when I started, when it was amateur, it was yeah. totally different to what it is now. I mean, obviously they didn't get paid, they had jobs. And, uh, for example, Adele Cardoni used to travel up from London on a Tuesday and Thursday um, and come for training, and then he'd go back to London afterwards. I think rugby is hugely important to, uh, to, to lots and lots of people. Uh, um, I, in terms of development and rugby, in terms of individual development, um, really, really worthwhile. It, it um, stimulates a lot of... Um, a lot of good ideals in people. In terms of rugby in Leicester, there are 27 clubs in Leicestershire and a lot of rugby clubs in, in, in Leicester itself. So um, the RFU has always been trying to drop the amount of clubs in Leicester, but a huge amount of people, certainly in the past, have always played rugby in Leicester. So it has always been an influential sport, in, particularly in Leicester, and always a, often a working class sport as well. Hence, you've got the development of Leicester Thursday, which uh, was purely and simply there for um, people who worked in shops and had Thursday afternoon off. Rugby is split up into lots and lots of social backgrounds, so you tend to find uh, the solicitors and lawyers play together, and you tend to find that working class people play together. My rugby club has always been a working class sport. Um, we are made up of small um, artisans, so plumbers, electricians, uh, bricklayers, that kind of thing, and it has always perpetuated itself by uh, through apprenticeship. So the people, the young lads who joined my rugby club, became apprentices to the people who, the older people who played at my rugby club. That's how rugby, my rugby club, and nearly every rugby club that I know of is, is perpetuated. Well, I started in the mid 1950s, and uh, I was playing for Stonygate Rugby Club who at the time had about five teams when they, on a Saturday afternoon. And I was playing in the lower end of the, of the teams, probably most of the time when I started I was in the fifth team, uh, playing as a wing forward. And I played for Stonygate in various uh, positions for, for about ten years until I retired at the ripe old age of 30. I started at South Leicester when I was five, stayed there till I was 14 and then moved to the Elstonians and played ever since down there, apart from two years when I went up Old Newtonians mm. and that's it. And I played county when I was a kid. Yeah. 
watching will be the social side of it that mm. fans can sit next to opposing fans and have a laugh and have banter. Playing wise, it's just fantastic. And then social side afterwards is just the best thing in the world yeah. ever. You know, it's not like football, they fall over and they start crying. Do you know, they get tackled, they're bleeding, they get up and they, they still play. Yeah. Do you know, and it's just that that makes you want to say to them, just get up and carry on in the do. Mm. I first went to go and play, uh, see my partner play, and he got three tries Aww. in the same game. Yeah. And it was brilliant. Um, and then my friend, um, her husband, he played with his son for the first time. Mm. And they both scored a try, and the, the look on the faces, because the father and son had both scored a try, it was, it was really nice. Yeah. Well, I was, I've been a member at the Leicester Tigers since 1960, which is 55 years. But my interest in rugby started just before then, when I went to Williston Grammar School in 1954. Uh, in those days, we didn't have a television at home, and in fact, until I went to grammar school, I'd never even seen a rugby match. Mm. But, uh, and I was pretty small in those days. Well, I'm not very big now, but, <laughs> and uh, I wasn't particularly fond of playing it with bigger lads, but I did like to watch it. Mm. And I first started going down to the Tigers in 1960, which was the year I started work with the County Council. And I've been going ever since. And I like the atmosphere, and uh, the crowds are, shall I say, better than football crowds. <laughs> you don't get a lot of rude chanting and things like that. And uh, certainly in the early years, in the 1960s, you could get to Welford Road for 10 to 3 and more or less sit where you like. I've been involved with rugby ever since I was a kid. Um, my grandparents and my mum and dad used to go down the Tigers and we every Saturday afternoon and we used to get shipped off to grandma's house so that they could go down and watch watch the Tigers and go to Twickenham and um, and it was always on sort of a Sunday afternoon on the, on the, the TV. We'd end up playing down the dining room because mum and, mum and dad are watching the rugby. Um, when we got a bit older, my dad used to run the scoreboard down at the um, Tigers ground. Um, and on the um, seconds team fixtures, where on a sort of a Saturday afternoon when the first team wasn't playing, um, we'd go down and sit in the in the little box up in the um, as was the old Crumby stand on little wooden benches that had um, white lines and the number in the middle, so you could see where your little section of your bottom had to sit, so other people's would be with the other side. And we used to go and sit down there and and help him sort of press the please have a safe journey home button when it used to be sort of one single line and of text and mm -hmm. uh, sort of the um, score on either side for the home and away team. We didn't even have a stretch to the um, a sort of wasps or tigers or, or anything like that. So first got interested in it sort of from a, from a very, very early age. It was always part of, of every, everything that we sort of did. Oh, ever since I was a, a baby, I should think because my father played for the Tigers before I was born, but he played for the Tigers and then he was on the committee and um, was um, involved with uh, the first team and, well, all of the teams really, but in, he was the first team secretary for many years and then became president of the club. Yeah, our son, he's um, 16. Mm -hmm. So a couple of weeks ago, he wanted to play down the Elstonians with his dad. Mm -hmm. So I said... I'm, I don't know, do you know, because like the big bloke's there, but he, he's a big lad for 16. Um, so I said to him, yeah, OK, only half. Mm. But he played the whole game and he, he played against his dad. Yeah. So he gave his dad a few good tackles and he scored against his dad. So it was really, really nice. Yeah, and he enjoyed you know? it. Yeah, he loves it. Yeah. He loves it because um, when he was playing for the school, um, it was... It could go to county level, they said. So they wanted to carry it on through school into college and it could go to county level because he's that good at playing. So I want him to carry on with rugby. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. like I said to him, 10 years' time, you could be playing for Leicester Tigers. Yeah. If he carries on the way he is. There's quite a lot of family history around um, rugby and supporting the Tigers. It goes back to um, my grandparents and even great-grandparents' era. Um, 
But uh, for me, yeah, it was at school, and then I joined the local club, having uh, having left school and played locally. Um, and then when the uh, the body gave up and got too old, then uh, yeah, it was down the Tigers really. So it's a huge part of my life, yeah, um, playing and supporting, yeah. Okay. So does your older family support Tigers? <laughs> yeah. So so my earliest sort of recollection of being at the Tigers was with. Um, with my mother, who was a season ticket holder. Um, before that, um, her her mother, so my, my grandmother was one of six children, all girls, um, who also supported Tigers. Um, and it was, I think it was how keen they were, right, where they were dragged kicking and screaming by their father mm -hmm. down to uh, to Welford Road. And um, um, so, yeah, so my mother really, I guess, was the, the first sort of linked to Tigers. But I now go with, so I'm a season ticket holder, so it's my brother, my son's a season ticket holder, and my nephew. So there's four of us that uh, go on a regular basis. My hometown is uh, Swansea, and I was educated at Swansea College of Education and trained to be a teacher. And that's the reason I came up to Leicester. I joined the Tigers in September 1969, and I played 333 games for them. My highlight of my career was to play against the Barbarians every Christmas and to play against great internationals like uh, Gareth Edwards and Barry John and other uh, Billy Beaumont and other famous rugby players. The other highlight was to play against the All Blacks in 1973 for the East Midlands. And finally, one of my last games in my career was the final of the John Player Cup when we lost to Gloucester at Twickenham by nine points uh, to three. Then after I retired, um, I was invited to be a summariser for BBC Radio Leicester. The commentator was another Welshman, uh, Van Hopkins, who was head teacher at Lancaster Boys School. And then after he retired as a commentator, I uh, took over as the commentator for BBC Radio Leicester. He did 20 years, and I'm on my 29th year as the commentator. It's always been around the guys, you know, I, I started the sport because it was a social event. Um, I knew, like I said, I'd, I'd gone through a, a, an accident and I had nine, ten months away from home having rehab. Uh, and I know sport is good for the mind, good for the body, good for the soul. It, you know, it, it got me out of the house and I've met a lot of people and I've travelled the world and I've been, you know, in a very privileged place and that wouldn't have happened if I would started playing wheelchair rugby. In 1977 a group of guys Canadian in Winnipeg got together and put together a sport called murder ball and basically it was um, the answer to a problem that the all been having is the fact we're neck injuries uh, affected in all four limbs and we couldn't physically compete at basketball. So they put the reds together, come up with a very raw game, ball on your knee, get from one side of the court to the other, completely full contact, and it was murder ball. And that, that's, that was the birth of a sport. In the late, or in like the early 80s, uh, they took the sport across the border to the USA and got USA interested in the sport. And then 1984, I was at Stoke Mandeville 
and the Canadians came over and put a demonstration of the sport on for us to see. Straight away for me, I was hooked because I was only being offered uh, sports like table tennis or archery, bowls. So there's nothing to fulfill my rugby days from school. So when this came along, you know, a game where you're playing full contact sport, you got the camaraderie of being with the guys. Um, we'd all got a common bond as we'd all had gone through a personal injury or been born with them um, with the disability problem so as well as having the enjoyment of the sport we also had that common bond of getting through life together you know understanding what we each other go through we decided we was ready to take it to the Paralympics so I was one of the first ones who went to the Paralympic Games it was Atlanta 1996 we went as a demonstration sport and just before we went we changed the name from Murder Ball which we thought was a little bit not quite PC enough to take to Paralympics. And because it's full contact with the cheers and we carry the ball over a touchline, it was agreed that it was going to be called wheelchair rugby. So that was the birth, really, on the big stage. Um, it was a big success. So I went to Atlanta, competed in Atlanta, and then four years down the line, I competed in Sydney, and then it was a full blown out medal sport. Four years on, I captained the team in Athens, so I've done three Paralympic Games and I've finished fourth. So I played through the quarterfinals twice. The worst place possible to be because you're just outside the medal. But, you know, fourth in the world is not a bad place to be. Uh, I retired from wheelchair rugby in uh, 2004 as the captain because I thought I'd done as much as I could do. Came out of retirement in 2005, did a quick tournament in Hong Kong. I'd not been to Hong Kong, so thought a good time to retire, come back out of retirement. And then I had a break from the rugby, and now I am uh, coach the Leicester Tigers team. We put together a wheelchair rugby team, and I coach that team. So hopefully I can pass that experience on to the new lads. Mainly it was the hockey and the volleyball. and um, you. When I was at school, um, especially um, secondary school, sort of between the years of 1997 and sort of 2000 and 2000, 2002, um, girls played girls sports and boys played boys sports and that was pretty much it. Um, but being from um, Beaumont Lees and being an inner city, rugby wasn't really part of the, the inner city sort of mm. curriculum um, and we were incredibly lucky that we did have big playing fields but the vast majority of, of sport that, that they played was either touch rugby because of all the insurances with um, goes with full contact if they could get the lads to play um, because of it's the city is dominated by by football um, and the closest rugby, rugby club to us was in was actually Belgrave um, so the vast ma the fact that I played for Anstey and the vast majority of the, the lads in my school played for Belgrave, slight rivalry, um, but it was, it was good banter. And we did play against them and we used to go down and watch and, and things where, especially when my sort of brother and, and stepbrother used to go and play Belgrave. And it was good rivalry, but I think, I think that's sort of what rugby does though. There, there is good rivalry because we ended up actually merging with um, South Leicester. They had their own girls team. Um, we, we were the only two in sort of uh, in the county and the city of Leicester to have a girls team. So we actually merged um, to allow us to actually actually play. So we were then known as the um, South Leicester Ladies, and we actually played down in um, at the South Leicester Rugby Ground, just the other side of um, Wigston. Um, and that, that was really good because we had proper changing rooms and we were able to use the facilities that the men used because the men would play on a um, Sunday morning and then we would play on a Sunday afternoon. We tried not to get two lots of home home games at the same time, otherwise you sort of, you didn't really want to go into the changing rooms. They were slightly slippery. Um, but we used to have to travel quite far though to, to get the games. Um, our closest team that we used to play reasonably regularly um, was Colville. Sort of as we got older, um, we got introduced to playing to playing rugby, mm -hmm. um, and I started in the under tens, um, which meant you had to it, sort of school age, um, 
at the start of the season, you had to be under 10. So essentially un- under 10 by sort of September. And then and my, brother, and my brother and my stepsister and my, my stepbrother all played. Um, my brother played in the started in the under eights where it was just tag rugby. But when um, myself and my um, stepbrother and my stepsister started, it was um, full contact rugby. Um, and the girls at that point would play in, in among with all of with all of the boys. So a sort of Saturday and sort of Saturday training Sunday Sunday mornings was no longer sort of nights have a nice relax on a Sunday. It was. Right, come on then, we're going to run around this pitch and you had to throw the ball. But it was it was incredibly, incredibly exhilarating and, and it sort of, it, ca- it carried on from there. I played right up through, through the ages because girls can only play with boys up until the age of 13 for obvious reasons. So once you progress up after the, un- after the under 13s, then you have to have a, a girls team um, and the boys would then carry on up through the ranks in um, up and up to the senior game um so myself and at, at the time my two best friends who there was three girls um in the team that I played played for the Anstey RFC and we decided that we would try and set up our own our own girls team um even though we were Anstey rugby club we actually played rugby up on Benyon Road in the Beaumont Lees because mm-hmm. there wasn't a big enough sort of space in Anstey with playing fields apart from the Anstey Martins High School playing field which was dominated for obvious reasons by all the football and everything mm. in 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 the village so we actually played actually played rugby in the city um, and we had a, a, a Leicester Mercury campaign and sort of pictures in the newspaper and we did we did all bits and bobs sort of flyers and banners and, and things trying to get people and, and we did really well actually the first season we did we had enough to field a full team which was the 15 girls mm. From three to fifteen, it was was pretty good. Um, we sort we sort of trailed off once some of the girls realised it wasn't quite as glamorous as they first thought. Um, but it it was really really good. Then after a while, uh, I came with my daughter just to some of the games, and then they had an advert in the um, program wanting volunteers to help to uh, do the catering, and I did that with my daughter. We used to make sandwiches on a Saturday if there was a home game, and then I got more involved with the catering at Oval Park as well. And in the end, I used to cater um, after training on a Tuesday and a Thursday evening, and we used to cook for the players. I enjoyed meeting the players and obviously you had contact with them and you knew them a lot more than now. Obviously there are some that I just don't know, which is sad, but I okay. did enjoy knowing them and seeing them. That's how I've been interested in it. Yeah. So we used to go down with him and uh, my mother and, and those days the ladies used to do the teas and I used to go down with her and uh, used to sort the teas out, serve the players. It is very much a, a, a sport where if you're a, a sort of competent um, sideline sort of helper and you get roped into it, it's not. It, it doesn't take very long for you to be roped in completely. It, you, if you show the slightest bit of enthusiasm, people will pounce on you, whether it's running touch lines or making tea or, or coaching the team when they haven't got a coach for that season, you will get pounced on. <laughs> well, I think it, it is, because arguably in the last... 20 years it's been the most successful of all our sporting teams I mean obviously the city and the cricket club have had their triumphs but for consistency I think the Tigers have uh, taken it and I should also mention the the ladies hockey team and the basketball team they've also done quite well so, so I'm quite you know fond of my sport in general I'm Leicester born and bred, so um, yeah, all sports are important to Leicester, I think. So you know, cricket, football, and rugby. But 
you know, clearly rugby's always been, um, you know, Tigers always been one of the top sides in the country. I think, um, you know, it has a huge support, you know, far in excess of any other, other club side. Um, and it's it's embedded in the city, I think. I think it's just, um, it is part of Leicester. And I think a lot of people will know Leicester purely from the name of the rugby club rather than anything else, maybe. so, mm -hmm. Or maybe Richard III <laughs> yeah, now, yeah. <laughs> maybe he's taken over a bit, but... Uh, but yeah, it's certainly, it's certainly a, you know, and I think that's why so many people play locally as well. There's so many local clubs, and I think because it's, you know, rugby is part of this city. Well, I, I think it's always been ingrained. I think there's that many clubs around the county now as well, and it helps a lot of kids. So I play for an inner city club, mm. and we have a lot of what we call waif and strays come down, and then they stick there. And mm. yeah, you just, all aspects of people play rugby, and it's good mm. for people, it's good for the town. Um, I brought in the main thing is, is my shirt, which I'm ever so proud of. Um, when professionalism came in, this is another, another little thing about football rather than rugby. Mm. Um, Leicester Tigers and the rugby teams in general started to change their shirt um, to make money and to, to sell them to the kids and everything. They changed the the you know, and I wanted to keep. I had my my original shirt that had for 150 years. And I'd had mine for, for how many years, eight or ten years. Um, well, not that one, but I'd had a, a shirt for you know, how many years. Um, and I, I didn't want to get rid of it. I didn't want it to wear it to shreds. I didn't want it to, to go, to get worn out and things. So I, um, I thought, well, I'll, get, I'll get, it, get, get a signature on it, a couple of signatures on it. Mm. Now, I mix with the, um, the, the past players in the past players bar at Leicester Tigers. And so I knew that I could see some of the old players mm. and, and um, quite easily. A few years ago, they had a, a money raising, a money raising event, not event, but a system where they, they had they had, they sold a brick, and you could have your have a brick with your name and an, and any an inscription on it um, to, to raise money. It was a buy a brick, buy a brick thing, and that these bricks were laid out on the concourse in front of the. Caterpillar stand, as it was then, the Metarex stand, and they were they were they were put beside um, Leicester Tigers. They had a, um, a voting thing for your for your favourite past player. So if you thought Dusty Hare was the best, then you could vote for him. And and they had these um, bricks with the the, the 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 fifteen players who were voted the top, and and, and our bricks were were put around them. Well, the first one is a program from the Oxford and Cambridge varsity match in 1961. And the, the reason I brought that, I already mentioned that I went to um, Wigiston School. Now the Cambridge captain on that day was Mike Wade, who in my first year at Wigiston was actually the senior prefect. Wow. And he went on to Cambridge University, in fact played in four varsity matches and uh, was the captain in the last one. So that's wow. the reason I brought that. The next one sort of ties in. This is a programme for when Leicestershire played Lancashire in the county championship semi-final in uh, 1966, mm -hmm. actually. Okay. In those days, county rugby was much more important uh, than it is today in that to play for England, you'd more or less got to play for your county. Mm. And the county championship was a big event. Uh, mm -hmm. In the Midlands, it, the matches were played in the in midweek, usually on a Thursday afternoon. Mm. But in the other part, in the north particularly, they were always played on, uh, on Saturday. Right, okay. But this is um, the programme from that match. Uh, the, uh, and it's interesting because Going back to the Cambridge program, mm -hmm. the Cambridge right winger was Malcolm Bussey, who played for Leicestershire in this match five years later on, on the left wing. And the, uh, the tight head prop, Nick Drake Lee, in the Cambridge side, actually went on to play for the Tigers, but on this occasion he was playing for Lancashire, mm -hmm. so they were on opposing sides. Mm -hmm. Uh, also of interest, in the second row for Leicestershire was Peter Tom, who of course is now the chairman of the Tigers. And um, the uh, Lancashire 
back rower was Dick Greenwood, who is the father of the Greenwood, who later played for the Tigers and in fact played for England in the 2003 World Cup. This is the programme from the South African Rugby Tour in 1961. Uh, I think in those days, apart from when the Tigers played the Barbarians at Christmas, the annual match against the touring team was probably the other highlight of the season. And uh, it, they usually played under the names of either East Midlands Counties or Midlands Counties and things like that, mm. because a club side on their own weren't strong enough to play the, the Springboks as they right. were then. And uh, this programme is when the Midland Counties played the South Africans at Welford Road in um, 1960. And the, it, the match ended in a three-all draw, one try apiece, as a try was only three points in those days. Mm -hmm. And that's the only uh, side that the South Africans didn't beat, apart from this one, which is the Barbarians who they always played at the end of, of a tour, the Barbarians versus South Africa, February 1961, mm -hmm. which the Barbarians won by six points to nil. And that was the only occasion on the tour that South Africa lost. Mm -hmm. And that and the other programme is the only one that they didn't win. So those two programmes that uh, sort of commemorate the only two matches on that tour that the, Barbar that the South Africans didn't actually win. I like history and I'm a bit of a, a collector of things, I guess, and uh, mm -hmm. and so um, obvious things to collect for me are the Tigers related, which um, you know I've sort of focused on programmes really. So um, so I'm not one to collect a programme from every game because I've probably not got a house big enough to uh, to store all that. But what I'm trying to do is is get a programme from um, each season, so a home home game um, from every season that um, that Tigers have played. So. Um, earliest I've got at the moment is around 1910, um, and then uh, you know through to, to modern day, which obviously is a lot not easy to get hold of. But um, I've got a few gaps between the wars, but um, you know probably about 10 or 15 I'm short of. But other than that, from 1910 through to present day, I've got um, got one program for every uh, every season. So yeah, so um, and I also collect other related programs with rugby. So. The European Cup Finals, World Cup Finals, things like that. So, okay. yeah. So I don't know. I don't know why I collect. I mean, I don't know why anybody <laughs> collects really. But it just, uh, yeah, it just sort of takes up a lot of space. But um, it's interesting. And what's interesting about the programs is the old Leicester ones. Is you know just reading the content and some of the things around. You know what was going on in the city, the social events. Okay, so um, you've never been interested in like playing rugby though yourself, no. you just like to watch it? No, I don't think ladies played <laughs> rugby when I was little. Because I didn't, you, they, they didn't have particularly female, um, it wasn't advertised about female rugby players. You didn't get the females playing on, on, um, on TV. Um, and there wasn't the high profile cases of women winning, winning the World Cup. Mm. Um, that's happened in the last sort of 10 years, I would definitely say. Sort of the end of my career, call it a career, um, it was starting to be a lot more forward thinking. Um, but no, I mean, my, my heroes for rugby was Neil Back, Martin Johnson, um, 
and influenced a bit more by my family because my nana's favourite show, show my nana's age as was was Dusty Hair. She used to speak a lot about Dusty Hair, um, Martin Johnson, um, Dean Richards. Um, he, I remember um, my nana telling me and, and I having photographs of him playing at the Tigers, um, Graham Roundtree, all of the, what I would class as old school, I mean, old school players where you could go and you could watch and they would, no airs and graces, they would play. Um, Richard Cockrell especially, I mean, he was brilliant. I loved him. Absolutely fantastic. And he's still with the club, which when you do find a club that you give you, especially if they give you your start, you do have an affection for that club and and how fantastic the Tigers were during sort of the 80s, 90s and early, early 20s. Why would you leave in Fortress Welford Road? And it's still called Fortress Welford Road. And that's such a thing to be to be proud of and for Leicester to be proud of. This is an extract from the Leicester Mercury, Monday, April the 22nd, 1889, of a rugby football match between Stonygate and Oadby. The Stonygate club finished up their season on Saturday last, when at Oadby they defeated the village club by one goal, three tries and 13 minors, to one goal, one try and two minors. Both clubs were strongly represented and Stonygate, having lost the toss, kicked off against a strong wind. The ball was quickly returned by the home forwards and a few minutes from the start, Oadby had secured a free trick in the Stonygate 25, awarded them for offside play from which Rathbone kicked a goal. Stonygate then played up brilliantly and aided by capital play by their three quarterbacks, the ball was taken close to the Oakby goal line where Ashton, cleverly picking up, rushed the ball over and gained a try. Pillsbury took a difficult place and scored a magnificent goal. At half time, the visitors were leading by four minors. In the second half of the game, Stonygate had all the best of the play, scoring three tries to one by Oadby. And when time was called, Stonygate emerged victorious. Favourite moment? Um, I suppose really, I don't know what my favourite moment is. There's been so many because I've been to, you know, several John Player Cup finals when Leicester have won and Leicester have lost. lost. Um, as far as probably proudest thing I think is that my father played for them although I never saw him, saw him but he played for over 100 games um, and he became president of the club and I think he was extremely proud to do that definitely he mm. was I mean he kept everything he did in relation to it and I think he was just so proud to belong to such a, a team.